My name is Chelsea McKinney, your host, and today I'm coming to you from Oceana Lagoon State Park, where monarchs are so abundant, it's an overwhelming sight. I'm here with Dr. Francis Villablanca from Cal Poly State University and our monarch butterfly expert. Dr. Villablanca, thank you so much for having us here at this amazing site. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm wondering if you can talk to us and tell us exactly how you got interested in a career path working with monarch butterflies. I think what got me started on my career path was I took a class in human ecology and it opened my eyes to how humans affect the environment around them and how humans can also improve the environment around them. That has led me to study a lot of different species, including monarch butterflies. Can you talk to me about what we want to know about monarchs and some interesting facts? Yeah, absolutely. The thing that you have to know about monarchs is their migration. So there are monarch butterflies here that got here around September. They're going to stay until around the end of February. Okay. They'll mate and then the females are going to leave and go in a search for milkweed where they can lay their eggs. They'll lay eggs and then they'll die and the caterpillars will hatch out and they'll feed on the milkweed. They'll grow up into adults. They'll mate and then they'll go off and search for milkweed and they'll keep moving sort of east and northeast and they'll do that for three to five cycles of breeding. Mm -hmm. And then the fifth cycle ends up in the north, like in Washington state. And as it gets colder and as the days get shorter, they shift and they stop breeding. And instead they go into this migration mode and they literally fly down here and start to spend the winter, but they come back to sites that they've never been to Wow. And their ancestors were here five generations ago, but these butterflies somehow found it on their own. So five generations it takes for this migration yeah. to occur. That yeah. is Three fascinating. Yeah, to five, something like that, yeah. And you mentioned milkweed as a particular plant species that the monarchs use. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So the other really key part of the monarch story is that they only lay eggs on milkweed and the caterpillars only feed on milkweed. And one of the things that happens is that the monarch butterflies get some toxins from those plants, some milkweed plants, and they put those toxins into their bodies and that makes them taste really bad. And so birds or other animals learn to, to stay avoid. away. Probably the biggest threat right now is the loss of milkweed itself. And there are probably two things that are happening with the loss of milkweed. One is just um, the conversion of land. So for example, from wild lands to ranch lands and then ranch lands to vineyard or something like that, where we're basically clearing the land and putting in plants that, that serve us and not necessarily wildlife. And a part of that is agriculture. So agriculture has gotten really, really efficient. And so we end up using a lot of pesticides and a lot of herbicides. Mm. And then that has a negative effect on the milkweed and then we have fewer monarchs. Dr. Villablanca, can you talk to us about how you go about studying the monarch populations and is there anything that you use to do that? Yeah, one of the things that we're really interested in is um, understanding the movement of monarch butterflies, say from this grove to another grove or to another grove. And the only way that you can make sure or know that a monarch has moved is to have something on the monarch so that you can see that thing move. And sure. So what we use are tiny little stickers or tags that we put on the outside of the wing of the monarch butterfly. They have a color on them so we can tell where, um, like what site we tagged the monarch butterflies at. Also has a um, toll free number and each monarch butterfly gets its own little serial number. All right. So if somebody sees a monarch butterfly that's tagged, they can actually call us up and say, hey, we found this monarch over here. We have a database, we know where we tagged it, and so we can understand how monarch butterflies are, are moving around. Now that is very cool. So even our students, if they were to find monarchs with stickers, that's something that they could actually help scientists help study populations. Absolutely. So if a student found a, a monarch that was dead on the ground, for sure you want to check both wings. 
If you see a monarch butterfly that's drinking nectar from a plant, see if you can sneak up on it and check the two wings and see if you can find a sticker on it. Is there any advice you would give to those watching on how they can further help protect and study the monarch butterfly? I think just caring actually goes a really long way. And so caring about monarch butterflies because they do this amazing migration, they pollinate, they're just really amazing to, to see. I think that would be a, just a great first step or second or third. And if somebody's really, really interested in directly trying to help monarchs, um, planting milkweed that you know, occurs in your area or planting nectaring plants, for example, um, that attracts uh, butterflies to your school or to your garden. Sure. So you get to see them, but it also helps the butterflies along. Well, I think that's fantastic advice, and I so appreciate you bringing us here and being able to see this amazing population and the incredible migration that they make each year. It's my pleasure, Chelsea. <laughs> Make sure to read everything and absorb all the information you can about wildlife. And volunteer. You're never too young to help. We'll see you guys next time on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Conservation Connect.